Good morning, everyone. Oh, wow, that's loud. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this, I think, uh, the most important panel of the entire, <laughs> <laughs> the entire conference, obviously. My name is Karen Green. I'm the curator of comics and cartoons at Columbia University uh, in the city of New York. And so I'm very happy to be here in San Francisco, and I'm uh, thrilled to be moderating this panel. Um, this is about queer comics and underground comics. I, my connection in many ways to this is through the gentleman at the end of this table. We acquired Howard Cruz's archives uh, last year. Um, yes, if somebody was going to applause, that was the right thing to do. <laughs> And it sits next to the archives of the Kitchen Sink Press, which holds correspondence from many of the people uh, on this podium, on this dais. Sorry, I'm at the podium. It's early. It's early and I'm jet lagged. Uh, so we're going to start talking to these folks because I really don't have much to say that would be of interest. These people are the interesting people. And we're going to start um, with everybody just by turn, maybe we'll start right here with Burton since he's closest to the to the ground zero. Uh, just talking about um, your LGBT, your first LGBTQ content in comics. Um, how did you get into it? How did that work? How did you get published? Where did you get published, etc.? Make sure they say their names. Make sure they oh. say their names. Hi, my name is Burton Clark, and um, at the time I first got involved with gay comics. Uh, Howard was the editor, and I was living in New York City. And um, I had seen the first issue of Gay Comics, and I was really, really excited about it, and uh, wanted to know if I would be able to uh, contribute to a follow-on issue. Um, the subject matter that I chose was um, uh, racial uh, uh, racism in, in the gay community. And it was a subject that I had not seen dealt with in any comic that I had read before. And one of my strongest influences as far as my, my work is concerned was Leonard Starr, who drew Mary Perkins on stage for 22 years, and it was syndicated in the New York Daily News. I liked his clean, sharp line, his, his, his excellent story, and his excellent characterizations. But during the 22 years of his strip, he had never featured, number one, um, uh, an openly gay character. And um, he only featured during the 22 years one person of color. And even then, that was considered controversial because he actually lost a few newspapers because of it. Uh, but he gained some newspapers because of it as well. So um, I wanted to depict a character um, that was openly gay and that was a person of color. And so I decided, again, to de deal with the subject of racism. And um, the story is called Cy Ross and the Snow Queen Syndrome. And it was a subject that you know I had discussed with a lot of my friends, and I thought was really um, would be very interesting and something that I hadn't seen before. Um, it was a five-page uh, story, and uh, this particular I haven't done very much as far as gay comics are concerned. I've done maybe five <laughs> stories all told. I mean that's that's the extent of my uh, contribution as far as like the number of stories that I've created. But this particular story has um, or has legs because it was. It's gone on to about, been reprinted about five times, including in French, in the French magazine GPA. And um, uh, I'm fortunate that people, when they read the story, um, they seem to remember it. And because it deals with racism in the gay community, it is still relevant today as, long as, as it was like 36 years ago, which is when I drew. I drew it in 1981. Um, and after that, uh, I did issue, well, one of the, a postscript to that is that the original artwork for that particular story, which is five pages, um, when it was mailed back to me from the publisher, uh, I never got it. The artwork was lost in transit, and that actually had a deep impact on me because I was very, very upset, and I actually didn't draw another comic story for about six years. And then the first story I did after that was called Seder, which is also for Gate Comics, I believe it was issue number 10. And then again, it was another five-page story. And the last one I did for Gate Comics was issue number 25, and it was entitled, my, Someday My Prince Will Come. So it's like I haven't done a lot as far as Gate Comics are concerned. Most of my artwork was drawing um, erotic illustrations for magazines like Manscape or Drummer or um, Play Guy, uh, magazines like that, none of which exist anymore. And um, the most recent thing that I did was uh, an illustration for uh, Queer Heroes Coloring Book um, by um, 
oh, uh, I forget, uh, Stack, Stack Deck Press, I believe it's called. Stack, Stack. Stack Deck Press. And it was a, a single page illustration of James Baldwin for their coloring book. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Lee, how about you? Uh, I'm Lee Mars, and uh, I started doing comics when I was two, but we're not going to cover those years. <laughs> They're kind of jam smeared and peanut butter covered. So um, I got into underground comics um, while I was uh, a partner at an alternative feature service. And we were hiring people um, to do work and we hired Trina. And I went over and met her. She just had a baby and, and it produced um, the first women's comics, comics by women. Uh, and I, I then saw the world of under, underground comics. I hadn't noticed them before. Uh, so uh, I was one of the founding mommies of women's comics. And uh, I uh, created a series, uh, The Further Fattening Adventures of Pudge Girl Blimp. Thanks, now send money. <laughs> and I, I was interested in, in creating stories about what was going on now. Um, it turned out there were no stories about uh, uh, fat people, there were no stories about gay people, there weren't any kind of uh, manifestation of that, particularly in comics. So I just did stories that were my friends' stories and my stories, all true stories, but filtered through the, the lens of Pudge. And then uh, I did work for gay comics. Um, I, uh, I did some original stories and then parodies. I had been a fan of Mad Magazine forever and loved the parodies. So uh, quite a few of the stories that I did uh, were versions of Jane Eyre or various things. Um, and then down to the current day, um, I've collected all the stories of Pudge Girl Blimp. Um, the original three issues, and then all her subsequent appearances into, into this volume, which is on sale today <laughs> at PRISM. I'm Howard Cruz, and I, uh, <laughs> a, lot, a, a lot of the people uh, you know, on this panel, um, I got to know because I was the founding editor of Gay Comics, and so they, I, I became aware of them. And you know, Burton was just talking about his joining on the second issue, and he's an example of someone who uh, whose style was so dazzling that uh, I was so so pleased to add it to the mix. Uh, I couldn't do a Leonard Star style <laughs> drawing to save my life, and my original artwork for Jerry Mack was lost in the same uh, uh, shipment as yours. The UPS truck was hijacked. Oh my God. Wow. And, wh and whoever hijacked it, having gotten whatever they thought was valuable in it, dumped the rest, which meant our artwork, uh, into a river. And so that's where our artwork wound up. Mm. Um, fortunately, I had photostats, so I've been able to continue to reprint. I started drawing, you know, when I was in grammar school, and you can see all of those drawings uh, when you go to Columbia University uh, and look in their archives. Uh, my paper trail is largely there. I got into underground comics because of the freedom it offered to, uh, to be totally you know, honest in the world, although it took me a while after getting into underground comics that I was ready to be honest enough to be open to gay in my comics. But, Editing uh, gay comics was part of part of uh, that. By the way, I've found uh, a number of copies. The first 
the first comic that ever had a gay themed story of mine was published in 1976. So what's that, 40 years ago? Uh, and I found uh, in my basement a number of extra copies of that, and I'm going to take them over to the uh, Prism store and, uh, you know, give them away uh, mm -hmm. if anyone wants them. But this first come, first served is only about 10. Um, anyway, I, uh, uh, my pro I wanted to be a mainstream cartoonist, not just an underground cartoonist. So I always had a parallel life drawing humorous illustrations for magazines and things like that at the same time that I had the freedom that you got in underground comics. And then the, the original underground comics movement kind of petered out uh, because of the, you know, because the hippie movement uh, receded. Uh, but the effects of it continued. There are now uncensored comics being done as alternative comics or indie comics uh, all over the place. And I'm sure that many people in this room, that would be the category you might fall into. So anyway, I, that's, yeah, I'm old, so there's too many stories to tell to take up time. So here's uh, Von Frick, another great find. <laughs> Hello, I'm Von Frick, and I basically started out as a political cartoonist for a series of gay newspapers back in the 19, late 1970s, and it just kind of evolved from there. And um, working for gay newspapers back in the day, you really did have a lot of flexibility for a lot of the material you can do. And I was fortunate to have worked with a series of amazing editors over the years who really helped me out along the ways. And I did a lot of uh, political cartooning for the Seattle Gay News first off. And, they gave me a full page every week to fill, which was just like a dream, because most strips at the time were just getting smaller and smaller. And here I had a whole page like Windsor McKay used to have to just fly out with my fancy with whatever I wanted to draw. In 1982, a friend of mine sent Howard some of my work, and Howard encouraged me to contribute to the early gay comics. And that was my first publication in Undergrounds. And it led to a solo book of mostly my newspaper work in 86 called Watch Out Comics. And I've dabbled in comics here and there. I tried doing mainstream work, but I just didn't have the feel for it. I just had to do material that felt real to me. And since my work was political, it was pretty hard finding places to publish it. Most of the comics back then, except for gay comics, were basically sex comics, and that just didn't really interest me that much. And <clears throat> I kind of stopped drawing comics for about 10 years, and I've gotten back into it. The internet has opened up things so wonderfully, I almost had to relearn how to draw, because back then you would have to draw for photo offset printing, now you have to draw for things being reduced down to pixels. It's <laughs> and mostly I can do work in color now, which was pretty difficult as an underground cartoonist to do back mm -hmm. then. And currently I'm working on a new political strip called The Swamp about their current political climate in this country. And I was really hesitant about doing it because I just did not want to draw Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, every time I tried, I felt dirty and I knew he probably liked it. <laughs> but then I've, Walt Kelly was a big influence for yes, me with yes. Pogo. And I realized I could draw him as a big old frog. I liked drawing frogs and it was okay <laughs> and the clouds parted. <laughs> and that's basically it at this point. <laughs> Thanks, Vaughn. Let's cross the abyss over to Diana. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Diana Green. Aw, oh, shucks. I feel bad. I didn't get you anything. Um, um, background, the first queer content that really resonated with me in comics was Jimmy Olsen in drag, which was, <laughs> he did that three times, and by the third time, going, Okay, this isn't your disguise kit. There's something else going on. <laughs> um, but from there, I found my way to the undergrounds and still in process, 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 as we all are coming out. Um, 
I was able to look at things I wasn't able to look at before in myself partially through these comics. And one of the end results of this is that I was the first trans woman to have my work print, maybe the only trans woman, I'm not sure, to have my work printed in gay comics. There were, there, there, oh shucks. <laughs> there was one trans person before me, a trans man named David Kotler, but he kind of fell off the radar. Nobody knows. He lives in Texas, and Isn't I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yeah? Hmm. Is he, last you heard, is he doing okay? Uh, yeah, that was several years ago. Okay. But he's doing uh, children's books now. Oh, good oh, for him. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of us end up doing children's books. I don't say that like it's a step down. It's just the way things work. Um, but um, my work was in gay comics 18 and 25, and um, Andy Mangles, who was the editor then, um, accepted my gender identification on my terms, which was quite a breakthrough for him because when he wrote an article on gays and comics for some of the fan press for years before that, he mis misgendered some trans characters mm -hmm. from straight stories. But I don't hold that against him. That's why they call it learning. Um, some of the slides you'll see up here with my name on them are obviously not my work, and some of them are not the work of queer cartoonists. They're coming up now. What now? They're coming up next. Uh-oh, look out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Are we, are we holding on these? or No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, long and short, if you want me to talk about this in more detail later, I will, but these are works by cartoonists that predate gay comics and have queer content. And some of them are demeaning, and some of them, like this one, are wonderful. And it's a real mixed bag. It shows how the evolution of queer thought happened outside of the queer community in underground comics, which weren't always the bastion of liberal thought that people <laughs> thought they were. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, I, did, I sort of stumbled onto doing this as an offshoot of teaching a course in the history of underground comics. And I suppose there was enough material here to put together a lecture on it. I'm obviously not going to give the whole lecture. This one is really tough to look at William Murphy's stuff. It's funny and insulting at the same time. Uh, yeah. 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 And Vaughn Bodie. This this is the one that really inspired me to start coming out. His his book Schizophrenia, where he talks about his gender issues. Like, you can do that in comics. Well, that means you can do it in life. Well, here I am. Okay. With that being me, we'll move on. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Roberta. Hey, hi, I'm Roberta Gregory, and I was, <laughs> I was drawing a lot of comics as a kid, but, um, and I was sneaking queer, con well, I mean, nobody else, nobody was seeing it but me, but I was kind of sneaking queer content into my sort of like pre-adult comics, like I had a strip with a sheep and a goat that were both male and seemed to be very good friends. And then I had a <laughs> kind of a funny superhero parody um, in which the supervillain from another planet kind of has a thing for this young man. Um, kind of adds a little tension, a little unusual tension. But um, and then I think I was doing historical comics. This was in high school, and I did one about the Egyptians, one about the Romans, and I had like a gay couple that were awfully stereotypical. I mean, this is like the late '60s, so it was just sort of me, kind of thinking, well. Nobody else is going to ever put this in comics, and nobody really, nobody's ever going to see these comics because I don't do the kind of comics that people want to read because I knew what comics got published, and that were things like Archie and um, you know Superman and Spider-Man and so forth, and women didn't even draw comics back then. I mean, so I was um, doing a lot of comics just for my own enjoyment, but... I figured, well, I'm going to have to get a real job doing, you know, something else because, you know, you can't make a living doing comics. And when I was in college, I was drawing strips for the, um, oh, let's see, for the um, Uncle Jam. That was a college paper, um, a humor paper run by Phil Ye, who's, um, he's, he runs cartoonists across America a lot. Some people know him. Uh, we were college buddies. And I did a strip, started doing a strip for him, Frida the Feminist, which was fun. It was um, my proto Frida character from Dynamite Damsels. And then when I was in the Women's uh, Resource Center, um, this was, this would be like about 1972. And that's when Women's Lib was coming to college campuses and there were women's resource offices and we had a newsletter and I did a feminist funny strip for the bottom of that. And um, 
It being the sort of early 70s, there were a lot of head shops, and I discovered underground comics, and lo and behold, there were whole booklets full of comics that were done by women. There were even comics that were published by women, like Nanny Goat Productions, Joyce Farmer, and Lynn Chevley. Lynn Chevley just passed away recently, which I'm very sorry to say. But um, that was tremendously inspiring because these women had all kinds of styles of drawing. I mean, there were autobio stories, there were very skillfully drawn, I saw Lee Mars stories, those were, I saw Trina's, um, Sandy comes out in issue number one, and then there's stories by women who only did a few stories and their styles weren't, they didn't show all that skill, but they had really, they were really telling their very own stories, and I just found that very, very inspiring. Uh, again, I just, you know, never thought I would ever be in making any money doing this, but I was very artistically thrilled. So I did a queer content story for issue number four of women's comics, which I hate now. I just can't even stand the, can't even, oh, I can't stand the sight of the bloody thing. My girlfriend at the time was, had gotten stoned when the, news, when the magazine salesman came by and subscribed to Modern Romance, so <laughs> we'd sit around reading these, so I thought, well, let me, do a, let me do a stupid lesbian parody of Modern Romance where the, you know, girl ends up with the wrong, she ends up with a guy and she's heartbroken and then she <laughs> finds the woman of her dreams and so forth. And Why I do you said, hate it? Oh, it looks like shit. Oh, I mean, okay. it's like it's badly Fair written, enough. it's badly drawn. Oh, geez, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, oh, definitely, yeah. But, um, and then, let's see, I think I did a few more stories for, um, I submitted to Women's Comics, and I think the very next story I submitted got turned down because there was really stiff competition for pages. I mean, that was like sort of the women's anthology in, I think, anywhere, anywhere in the world. And um, that's also where I developed this really, really tight, you know, tight drawing style, small panels, very wordy, because uh, we'd get assigned just a few pages. So um, I decided to do my own comic book full of uh, Frida stories, and that turned into Dynamite Damsels. And um, I self-published that uh, by, I was it very inspired by Lynn Chevley and Joyce Farmer. They had Nanny Goat Productions, and I lived in Long Beach at the time. I was going to school there. They lived in Laguna Beach. And all the, all the really cool stuff was going on in San Francisco, but I was really happy to have a couple of mentors who were very helpful in helping me get my comic into print. And it was distributed along with um, all the other undergrounds through Last Gasp. I think there was like, there were only like one or two comic distributors back then. And I would send, there used to be all these women's bookstores back then also. I'd send yeah. like a comic book to them with a little note saying, you know, send me six dollars and I'll send you ten of these to sell. They were selling for a dollar each. I think postage was like 35 cents for a, you know, package of comics. It was a different economy back then. So I went through an incredible amount of dynamite. I mean, I had, I did a printing of 10,000, which was a really small yeah. press run back then. It was still like 30-something boxes of books, comics I had to do something with. And now I'm down to about maybe five or six ratty little <laughs> issues. I mean, who'd think? But, um, and then I contributed some LGBT content stories to Tits and Clits, which was Joyce and Lynn's anthology. And then uh, Howard asked me to be in gay comics, and that was kind of exciting because he wanted, one of his, his policy was to have equal you know, representation of men and women artists, and there really weren't that many women doing comics back then. So. I got to be in almost every one of the, probably the first half of the issues, which I was just delighted about. So, and I think that's definitely my best work. I think I have much better work um, in gay comics than the stories I did for, for um, women's comics. And I'm really trying to get a collection of those. I mean, they're, you know, they're, a lot of them are dated, but some of them are kind of fun. And I was dealing with um, issues that, 
things that I just thought were cool I didn't see in comics. I had a story about a woman alcoholic. I was in like an abusive alcoholic relationship with another woman and that gave that was inspiring. I did a story about bisexuality. I did a story about a lesbian mom. I did a transgender story because I was living with a transgender person back then. That would be around 1984. So it was fun just to really explore storytelling with words and pictures and I'm still trying to do it. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that too. Uh, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. Sorry. I've been doing a lot. Been doing a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Trina? Hi, I'm Trina. Whoops. I'm Trina Whoops. That's funny, yeah. Um, <laughs> Trina Robbins. Um, <laughs> like so many people, I, was, I started drawing as a child as soon as I could get my tiny little grubby fingers around a, an eraser, not, not, not an eraser, I used to eat the erasers, um, <laughs> around a number two pencil. Um, and I always read comics, I drew comics as a kid. Um, my first professional, <laughs> professional, uh, first published comic was in the East Village Other, uh, which was an underground newspaper in New York in 1966. And I had been drawing comics for at least a few years at that point, um, when I discovered feminism, that would be about 68 or 69, and became a feminist. And uh, it was very small. At that point in 1970, I was already, I had moved to San Francisco because that was the mecca of underground comics. Um, there was a very small group, really. Everybody who drew underground comics knew everyone else. And there were only two women, me and a woman named Willie Mendez, uh, in San Francisco who drew comics and what the guys were doing unfortunately you know because there was no comics codes it was oh boy we can draw whatever we want unfortunately a lot of it was just unbelievably misogynist I mean those of you who never saw that stuff those of you who are too young to have seen it would really be quite horrified at what they were drawing um, and because I um, because I objected, because I said this is misogynist, I got a reputation of being just a really mean old bitch, you know, who, I mean, men would actually say, I swear to God, they would say, here comes Trina, hide the knives. Oh my God. Um, several years later, I think it was in the 80s, that Jen Camper visited me, and we met for the first time and got along swell, and at a certain point she said to me, you know, you're not at all like what I expected. You're actually fluffy. <laughs> it's because it's because people really expected me to this to be this. Oh, and people also used to say when they met me, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> but that reputation was simply because I objected to comics in which women were raped and beheaded and eviscerated, and the whole thing was considered funny. Um, so by 1970, oh, and yeah, the guys, of course, not only thought I had no sense of humor and that they should hide the knives, but they weren't inviting me into their books, naturally. Um, so by 1970, I was in San Francisco. I joined the staff of It Ain't Me Babe, which was the first women's liberation newspaper in the country. I drew comics for them. And because I was working with them, uh, I felt strong enough to put together the very first all-woman comic book, and that was at Ain't Me Babe Comics in 1970. And it was when the book was already had already gone to press that I met Lee. She she arrived just too late to be in mm. It Ain't Me Babe Comics. Um, two years later, we all met, about 10 of us. In the beginning, when I put together It Ain't Me Babe, there was really only me and Willie, and the others were women that I kind of, um, I kind of conscript, conscripted because I knew they were good artists, and I said, why don't you do a comic? And that's how we filled the book. But by 1972, there were enough of us so that 10 women could meet in San Francisco and put together the first issue of women's comics, which lasted for 17 issues and 20 years. It was. <laughs> it was for 
women's comics for the first issue that I did, Sandy Comes Out, which I didn't know at the time was the very first comic about an out lesbian. It was just Sandy was my roommate and I wanted to tell her story. Uh, but Mary Wing saw that story. <laughs> <laughs> and she was furious because how dare this straight girl do a comic about a lesbian. And so that inspired her to do come out comics. So yay, I'm responsible for Mary Wings' comics. <laughs> oh, so let's tie this in with gay comics, okay. So I think it was, was it, Howard, was it 1980 that you decided to do gay comics? Yeah, but it's okay. not the solicitation Yes, that's what I was going to talk about. Yeah, so I got this letter from Howard saying that he was about to start editing something called gay comics. My first reaction was I should have known he was gay because he's such a nice guy. <laughs> because really, really the men in the underground for the most part were not nice guys. Um, but I didn't send anything because I felt, well, I'm straight. I don't have the right to do this. I have to give gay cartoonists a chance. Uh, but then when Robert took over, Robert Tripto, he invited me into the book, and I was so honored, and I have always been so fucking honored to be included, you know, in gay comics and by gay people. And Robert, if you're there in the audience, I can't see you because I just had cataract surgery, but if you're Front there row. in the audience, I love you, Robert. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, I've done, obviously, I think you've seen some of my stuff up there. I've done, a, since 1970, I mean, 71, 72, I did a lot of comics uh, with lesbian scenes in them. And um, one of the last things you'll see up there is from my younger, my series for younger readers, the uh, Chicagoland Detective Agency, in which I actually snuck in a teenage witch who was a lesbian. My editor, and not her fault, you know, because it's the publishers, really, she, they, I was not allowed to use the word lesbian. Um, but that's okay, because she fell in love with the other girl, and we saw that, and she wound up with another girlfriend, and we saw that. So um, here I am, and I have four books coming out this year, by the way. I have cards. Mary. Thanks, Jana. Mary? Well, so now you know where I, I wrote the comic book. <laughs> and um, yes, I was very upset because it seemed very superficial to me. And um, of course, Trina was re writing from outside the point of view of Sandy, in a way. And it has a very kind of distanced feel. So I had But to... I wrote it with Sandy. I, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me this, this conversation's been going on for a while. A yes. long time. <laughs> Later, we'll talk about the breasts. I feel, still think, defy gravity, the breasts that Trina drew. But We were all younger then, Mary. <laughs> we shared a hotel room. Hers are still like that. So I forgive her. So um, listening to everybody's uh, fabulous uh, experience here, I, have, I just started very reactively. So Trina drew this, and I thought we just don't have enough lesbian comic books, and they have to be more and better and deeper and whatever. So I just wrote that. And the interesting thing was I didn't know about shrinking drawings down, so I drew it to scale. So it's <laughs> really klutzy. But it was, um, I, I've kind of never done anything to publish. I just kind of see that it needs to be there. Like Burton, what you said, you said it wasn't there. It just wasn't there. And that kind of brings me to another thing, and I guess the only interesting thing about my background, because I'm, I'm so reactive. The other day I was mad about something political. I did some cartoons. I put everything with glue on plastic, special plastic sheets in my bicycle bag. I went out, put them up all over my neighborhood. I had someone chasing me and threw something at me. So I do th things in a reactive way, or I do them because they're not there. I don't think about, gee, what's my next book? I, it doesn't seem to me like I have anything particularly interesting to tell. It just something should be told. And I, uh, when everyone talks about their great experience, and I'm so jealous that Roberta's father worked for Disney, but um, I, was, I was really lucky enough to um, be in a great books curriculum 
uh, in mm -hmm. my, that was my, uh, I guess, educational experience. We had to read 65 books a week. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I read and ate at the same time. <laughs> I, it, was, it's, it was a very, very intense experience, and I did it for three years, and all these years later, I never forget. It comes into mm -hmm. everything that I do. And so I'm just going to bring a little bit of historical analysis to all this if I can. Because I was thinking the other day, looking at the panel, what made us do it? Well, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But behind it not being there, it, it was totally illegal to smoke weed, but everyone was doing it. There was a war nobody wanted. I knew guys in college who cut off their index fingers with laser saws in the lab so they wouldn't get you know, drafted. People were going to Canada. There was such an intense underground that was completely belied by the mainstream. The mainstream was like a glass wall. And there's a way that you, know, you just wanted, you, we just had to break through it. And so what was it that collectively made us all go out there, and I keep thinking it was like a big blank page. It was also like a big uh, vacuum. It sucked it out of us, because mm -hmm. it was in us. And also we came from two generations of our parents were probably depression parents, very rigid, very concerned about money and getting by. You know, we, appreci we didn't appreciate that then, maybe more now. But I think that that kind of atmosphere of the kind of the terror of our parents, the, ca the saving string for everything, and our own sort of blossoming in that culture historically just sort of propelled all this stuff out of us. So it's just kind so, of what I'm thinking these days. So actually, following up on that, um, and, and in a question that uh, refers to something that most of you have alluded to, uh, but not all said explicitly. So for example, Alison Bechdahl has said that reading Wendell is what inspired her to do Dykes to Watch Out For because it made her think that she could could put a, a lesbian comic out there. Um, probably many people in this room have been inspired by at least one of the people on this, on this dais. But you guys are the uh, forefathers and foremothers. So some of you have talked about things that you've, that you've read or things that were out there or, or kind of unsuspected gay content in straight content in straight comics, but were there were there any gay comics out there? Was anybody doing no. anything no. that you no. read that no. inspired there was nothing. you? No, there's nothing. And, and it just happened that you decided all at the same time to start no, doing it, this? No, it was it was in the water. It was in the like water. The alien. It was literally <laughs> like I can't really when Bert you were saying, it just had to be there. I mean, you didn't even think about it. It was like it was it was just it was like vacuum that sucked it out of us. Sort of did you feel a little that way? Well, I just felt I wasn't represented and like I read Leonard Star religiously for twenty two years and was always hoping because he dealt with Film and he dealt with the theater. theater. <laughs> and there were never any gay people in the storylines, ever. Yeah. And I just thought, this is. This oh, that's I'm the one with here. the lesbian witch, by the way. I thought, you know, I, this, I, I want to see me out there. I want to see me out there. You know, and I loved his work so much, I felt like, well, he had a heavy influence on the way I draw, so I figured, like, I'm going to make Leonard Starr's gay story. <laughs> oh, Featuring, right. yeah. There was a lot of subtext. I mean, your standard superhero comic. <laughs> have this uh, gym bunny in a two tight outfit with a secret identity. Right. There were lots to read, you know, between the lines, so to speak. Right, and, and the... And Robin, the, know, uh, the exactly, the, uh, the Kefauver Commission mm -hmm. particularly targeted this kind of grown man boy sidekick as being too homoerotic and put the kibosh on it once the code kicked in. But um, if I can say something, you uh, can. there were other comics um, that inspired a lot of young gay boys. And one of them, which I read also and loved, was Katie Keene. Katie, <laughs> Katie Keene was, she was an actress, and she was very pretty, and she had lots of clothes, and readers would <laughs> send in designs for the clothes. Mm. And I, I, have I know, although I haven't seen them for ages, a lot of guys 
who were young contributors and sent in designs for Katie's clothes, and it is no surprise that it turns out that they were all gay. This was a comic that gay boys loved, and years later, I did the same thing, copying Katie Keene. You know, you know, if you want to say, what's my influence, that Katie is a big influence. I did comics for girls, because there was nothing out there for girls. I did a, a series, six part, Meet Misty, for um, Marvel, and then an eight part series, California Girls, for Eclipse, and they all featured designs by readers who would send in designs, and years later, this was in the 80s, you know, I, I met or heard from a lot of these guys, and you know, big surprise, they were all gay. So um, this is another big influence. Go ahead, say, Howard. I to say something about when, when we decided to start gay comics. Can you grab the mic, Howard? Oh. When Thanks. we started to uh, do gay comics, Dennis Kitchen invited me to edit a new series to be called Gay Comics. I was inspired by uh, Mary Wings and Roberta Gregory. Uh, they were doing the kind of human-based uh, stories, life, real life-based stories that I wanted gay comics uh, to include. There had been a previous uh, male gay series uh, called Gay Heartthrobs, which was by Larry Fuller. Uh, created that, and he, uh, uh, but and, and that broke ground. But one thing it didn't do much was address the everyday lives uh, or the inner feelings. It, it was more sort of campy um, and sexual. So, uh, but I saw uh, Mary's uh, come out comics in Dyke Shorts, and I saw Roberta's uh, Dynamite Damsels. So I wanted to be sure that gay comics was co-gender. Uh, I did not want it to be a boys club. And I was so pleased that when I contacted them that they were interested. I mean, uh, you know, Roberta talks like, oh, it was such a privilege. But I mean, I was, it was privileged to have her uh, in the book because it sent a message. This is, we do not want this to be an all boys club. We want this to be different points of view. And, and I was so pleased when uh, David Kotler, the uh, as far as I know, the only, at the time, and I, I was doing gay comics, it was the only trans story that was submitted. I had no way of knowing who out there was trans. But I got uh, David's story, and uh, who, you know, and, and, and it was so pleasing because that could uh, fill out some more of the variety that we wanted to have. But anyway, I just want to mention, you know, she mentioned, uh, Alison Beckdale said Wendell inspired her, but you guys inspired me. I can't emphasize enough what it was like having the whole landscape and nothing that reflected our own lives. It was, it was like we were invisible. We didn't exist. And um, I think for many of us, um, that condition couldn't continue, shouldn't continue. So putting out in comic book stories what our lives were like and was personally liberating, of course, but more important, getting the word out was vital. And so every time one of these issues came out, it was even more liberating and strengthening. Can I say one, one quick thing? Of course. You were talking about why was all this, did all this happen at once? And you have to understand that liberation was in the air. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You had one group after another, women's liberation, uh, you know, but that was on top of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Uh, so in a sense, it was uh, the lack of a gay movement was uh, you know, conspicuous by its absence until the Stonewall riots. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a, a gay movement before that, but this was the first, uh, that was when the real street level uh, activism uh, caught fire uh, and quickly was a national thing. And so those of us who wanted to be able to be free in our artwork 
uh, saw that, oh, this is a time, you know, this is time for us to do that. And uh, so I think that's one reason it, it took fire at that particular time in history. Were most of you self-publishing before gay comics came along? Did, did any of you, other than Trina, I guess, perhaps, get into some of the more standard um, underground anthologies that were, that were getting published at the time? Dennis Kitchen was publishing me. Right. Dennis was the first, um, in 1970, I think it was, or maybe 71, as I mentioned, the guys were not inviting me into their books, but I got a letter from Dennis Kitchen inviting me into one of his comics, and he was the first underground cartoonist to invite me into, into his book. Um, the other stuff was indeed published, but not, nobody invited me into the books. I simply sent my work to the print mint and they published it. They were very good. It wasn't, I, when I talk about having, being left out, you know, being excluded, it was not the publishers who excluded me. They saw good comics and they knew it would sell and they printed it. It was just the guys. But Dennis was the first one to invite me into his book. So I was published by Star Reach Productions. Mm. And, uh, yay, <laughs> yay. Who's behind that? <laughs> that was Mike Friedrich, who's sitting in the front row. Oh. He was very supportive, um, and uh, for, for his publications, in addition to Pudge, um, he... Uh, in his Star Reach line, he published Star Stark's Quest, a very long and serious um, lesbian story. Howard, I think uh, it was either your decision or your decision with Dennis Kitchen to send the, the first solicitation letter to Gay Comics to just as wide a swath of cartoonists as possible without making any sort of assumption about what their their inclinations were one way or the other. Um, how many of you were published in Howard's issues of gay comics and responded to that first solicitation letter? And what was it like to get that? Well, I mean, it was great because we, we had no way, you know, there was no list of queer cartoonists <laughs> anywhere. And so we didn't know who out there uh, might be uh, closeted, uh, but maybe ready to join in to this enterprise. So it's, as Karen said, we sent out uh, a letter. I mean, Dennis asked me to compose a solicitation letter. And the letter uh, basically said, you know, we don't know who's gay, uh, but if you're not, but you have a cartoonist friend who is, please pass this letter on to them. And uh, even though that gave him a, a lot of room to not feel threatened, some of them still managed to be threatened that they had gotten that letter. Uh, but then it was a matter of hoping people would show up. I mean, with the exception of people I either was already a fan of, like uh, Mary and Roberta, uh, and we, I was already a fan of Lee, but was delighted when she volunteered to be in it because uh, she had already had a strong following because of Pudge and the other work she had done for women's comics and everybody. And we had the um, uh, Rand Holmes who uh, at the time I didn't know was bisexual, uh, he sort of out of the blue, he had a big reputation. He, uh, and, uh, you know, he just volunteered to do the cover uh, for the first one. And uh, I had thought when we started it, we would be, you know, if we could just get half of a book that was really good work and the rest of it was a little you know, drossy, uh, we would still have accomplished something because we didn't know how who was out there, and we wound up getting uh, you know a number of people that kept showing up, uh, sending in stuff. Particularly after the first issue, when they uh, realized, oh, this is real. <laughs> well, Howard was the first cartoonist to really come out, and it was a pretty risky thing, you know, being a commercial artist back then, doing contractual work because uh, it's. You know, discrimination was so rampant. I mean, there were artists like um, Tom of Finland who mm -hmm. were doing sequential erotic comics of a sort, but that was really severely ghettoized. But to mm -hmm. be a working commercial artist and come out back then, 
I'm still just totally amazed by that. <laughs> and I mean, I had been following your work for years, and when he came out, woohoo! <laughs> 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 Things are changing. <laughs> Well, I, remember, I wasn't the first uh, gay cartoonist because we have some others who preceded me in, on the like women's side. The well, I think also the important thing that we're talking about here that, I don't know, looking at the audience, so many people remember, but there was huge fear. I mean, I was, yeah. when I pen come out comics, I was not going to be a teacher. I had been raised to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be a teacher. When I, when I put that out there on some little mimeograph machine, I figured that might be over. And also, what was very peculiar when you think now, how many people were closeted in the theater and the art world in New York? New York was particularly a closeted place in the arts, even though it was everyone knew. So there was a very kind of thin wall, but it was an iron curtain at the same time. Another thing about gay comics was its continuity. Um, I can't emphasize how important it is that you regularly produce comics mm -hmm. and to find a venue where you can regularly um, pursue your craft and get better and better. To do that, you have to have a source. You've got to have some place that you're published regularly. And so for many of us, me included, having this place meant that we could get better and better. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I liked it just because it was such a, you know, gay comics, like, oh, well, now we use the term LGBTQIA and so forth, but it was basically just, you know, it was just a really wide spectrum of stories. I mean, I did all kinds of stories. I mean, I've never, Never really liked labels anyway. I mean, I'm not sure if I even really identified as lesbian just so much as I'm just not normal and I don't care and I'm never gonna be like a famous artist so I don't have to worry about nobody ever wanting to publish me because, you know, they don't want to be seen with me. But, I mean, you know, it was just, to me it was just liberating. I mean, I did all kinds of stories and, you know, I seven page stories, things about gender and so forth. And um, it was just a lot of fun. It was very, there was really nothing else like it back then. And like Lee was saying, just that it was, it came out on a regular basis. It was something you could look forward to. Uh, just speaking to the issue of um, exotic and mundane storylines, I just remembered one of um, Howard's gay comic stories was two guys arguing about whose turn it was to do the laundry. That's the whole story. So, ooh. It was a good story, though. That could turn into a murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's good to see you, Diana. He, uh, Diana and I have been in correspondence for, what, decades, I think. But I didn't know what you looked like. So, <laughs> I'm, really I'm glad nice you're not you. mad at me, because the last time we talked, I woke you up. <laughs> so, I'm going to preempt the inevitable audience question of what kind of pen do you use uh, <laughs> by ask sorry by asking you when you were starting out what were the sorts of tools and techniques that you were using and how has that changed to what you're doing now and anybody can chime in we don't have to go in any kind of order Air train. my <laughs> earliest work was done with a magic marker and it was not penciled. I didn't know you were supposed to pencil. I just took the magic marker and the paper and drew. Wow. In fact, I think my earliest, uh, I didn't use a ruler at all for my, my panels or anything. I mean, I, I didn't know that there were rules. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I started. It's I a good way. use everything for pentagraphs mostly, but I do a lot of brush work and uh, dip pens and for background patterns, I've even carved things into potatoes and kind of did the stamp thing. So. Nice. <laughs> and you've been doing that since you started? Pretty much, yeah. My father gave me a rapidograph when I was eight. Aww. And I became addicted to rapidographs and had to uh, work out ways to make my rapidograph line not look like a rapidograph line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over the years because it was too sterile and so I, I sort of tricked huh. people. A lot of, some people are surprised that I'm drawing, still drawing 
with rapidograph, except Wendell's hair. I have to have a brush for that. Yeah, there's a lot of rapid rapidographs were really popular back then. It was like a pen you could like fill and it would hold ink for a while. I think Dynamite Damsel, I drew that with like a dip pen and that was kind of a mess. I mean, because I think there's places where it's smeared and so forth. But rapidographs are very fussy though. I mean, there are all these different things you had to do. You had to clean them out so they wouldn't get clogged. And they're little tiny wires that you could accidentally bend and then You need a degree kind of in engineering to use a Mine always clogged. I had a friend who worked in a marine biology lab. They used rapidographs for the tiny, tiny lab. Actually, I worked in the lab with her. And they would keep them in a jar with like a little damp sponge to keep them humid. That was really exciting, so I kept mine in a jar for a while. <laughs> then I kind of got tired of rapidographs and discovered, I think, Rotring. It's like a kind of German pen that you fill with ink, like real, like India ink, and you can draw with them. And I think I did all the naughty bits as comics with those. And now I'm kind of lazy and use throwaway pens. Well, also the printing technology was totally different back then. It was offset printing instead of the laser scans that we have today, so you really had to have a distinct line that could be photographed and transferred to a printing plate. And um, one of my jobs to support my cartooning was I used to uh, operate uh, photostat cameras for newspapers, so I would do reductions all the times of artworks. So I kind of develop sort of a feel of what would we produce at 60%, 75%, and now with their laser scans, you could pretty much throw as much detail as you want into it. It really, really is different times as far as that goes. Use the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. So I was just saying there are a lot of comics now that never see print and they still sell really well. Good for them. Uh, I train in the traditional manner too, and I love it and I still work with it. But my friend Terry Beatty does his um, daily Rex Morgan strip entirely on a Wacom tablet. With, is it Wacom or Wacom? Whatever. Wacom. 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 Let's all say it. Wacom. Wacom. <laughs> um, and. He just scans in his blue line, inks it there, and there are no originals. Mm. And he's making a halfway decent living doing a daily strip doing that. And he trained in the traditional way, too. Yeah, but he's so never going to be able to sell his original art. Well, <laughs> well, he still has other originals to sell. I think he does his Phantom Sundays the old school way. But the point is that not only does the technology not matter as much anymore in terms of printing, but printing itself in comics is not a requirement for queer cartoonists mm. anymore. And that's both, good and, that's both good and bad. There's something really great about holding one of these. And I feel sorry for kids that grow up without that. And also, all of us up here. Microphone. All of us up here would pretty much do our cartoons from start to finish, from the conception to the final inking. A lot of commercial cartooning back then, it was very much a production line. There'd be the editor, there'd be the writer, there'd be the penciler, there'd be the inker. But we pretty much did it all. And for me, that was the real draw. I just didn't want to be part of a production team. How about you, Burton? Did you? Uh... Um, uh, again, uh, trying to um, ape Leonard Starr's work, I used a lot of um, uh, brushwork, brushwork and uh, rapidograph. And, um, one ongoing project that I have that's really not related to gay comics, but every year since 1986, I've drawn my own holiday card. And generally, I use either brush or a rapidograph for that. And that's an ongoing project that I've done now like since 1986. Last year was the 30th year in a row. I haven't missed. And I send out about 250 a year because it's, like, it's kind of like a gift that I'm sharing with my friends and family. And um, it's sort of a, an obligation that I don't want to fall down on every year, but again, it's gotten me much, much better with using rapidograph. It's very time consuming, but it's the method that works best for me. And we love your Christmas cards. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Sooner you. or later, you've got to collect them in a book. Yes. Remember Zipatone? Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you can even get Zipatone anymore. Remember the cat? No, you can't. That got stuck under the Zipatone? <laughs> oh. 
And now, I mean, I have some really, really early work, comics I did in 1969, and the Zipatone, it's not just yellowed, but it, it's curled off, really. You know, it doesn't really last forever. You'd end up with Zipatone in your socks. <laughs> there would be Zipatone in the bathroom. It was amazing. I started, uh, I started out using crow quill pins and speedball pins. Um, and a few years in, along came rapidographs. And I can remember an underground comics party one evening, everybody knocking back beers and arguing about rapidographs. That was the only subject. <laughs> and uh, S. Clay Wilson uh, beat up a guy in the backyard. It was a colorful time. <laughs> About Zipatone, Zipatone, I used, I, there was a period of my life in the late 70s when I did, put a lot of Zipatone into my uh, Barefoots comics, and it, I rue the day um, <laughs> because scanners don't like Zipatone. It's hmm. very, very hard to not have moiré patterns. Uh, hmm. And so some of my, in recent years, really from 1990 on, or 90, rather 2000 on, um, I've often had to go in and sometimes I use a hair, uh, a hair heater, what do you call them, a hair rub? Um, hair dryer. Hair, hair dryer, dryer to get the adhesive to turn loose and get the uh, uh, zip tone off because then you can get what you, the same effect you wanted just easily in Photoshop, and you can get a perfect screen. Um, so, the, and in some cases, I couldn't get the stuff off, and so I had to use Photoshop and just carefully, you know, redraw the insides of things uh, to delete um, delete the zip tone. So, I, if it's gone away now, I mean, it was handy at its time. It, it made for nice looks at the time, but it did not hold up well over time. I've got a question for everybody. I know my answer to it. Does Photoshop make it too perfect? No. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> well, Does anyone here need to know what Zipatone is? We keep talking about it. Oh, oh bless your heart. Wow. Basically, it came in big sheets and it was dots of various gradations so you can get an even grayscale without doing too much, you know, cross hatching or pointillism. And with an adhesive yeah. back. You would carve it out with an X-Acto knife and put it on the artwork and try to get it to line up with their borderlines as best as you could. You know, now with scanners and computer technology, you just kind of type in the grayscale and it appears like magic. We used to have to do all of that manually. I must be the only person here that doesn't use Photoshop. I mean, I'm still kind of scared of computers, so I, I draw don't use everything. Photoshop either. And and of course, I I'm starting to write another comic book. It's been 50 years since I wrote the last one, Aww. so I'm kind of starting out in the. Thank you. Don't clap yet. It's very painful <laughs> <laughs> to see. To it's painful to make ugly things. Let's face it. So I'm trying everything under the sun. And Howard's been an incredible encouragement, but um, I've really decided not to do any computer stuff. Maybe I'll do a few reversals, but it's that hand look that once you put it in the computer, it's kind of over, you know? It loses. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It changes it. But Well, I found that if you, um, I, I do my roughs the way we always have, and then uh, trace over using pencil. And then if you scan in the pencil, it becomes digital ink. Mm -hmm. And this is a way you <laughs> lose an entire level of process. Hmm. And you can make adjustments. So I think that way you can keep the hand feel, but have control over it. Um, I don't use a computer at all. Um, I'm really old-fashioned that way, and I prefer to do it all by hand. I agree that I like the hand-drawn look. Uh, sometimes with titles, I will start off with a, uh, you know, a professional font, but then I will trace it uh, because it, in, in, for, to ink. 
because I like the uh, imperfections. I think the imperfections uh, add warmth to the drawing. I don't want something that looks like it was done by a machine. Uh, so I, I incorporate the computer uh, in my uh, process a lot, but I still draw ink on paper uh, in, in the first place. Okay, let's get back to the undergrounds for a sec. Um, I'm curious, how, how was your work regarded, greeted by the other folks doing the undergrounds? Now, you've talked about Dennis really starting you on this trip, so clearly Dennis was fine with it. Trina's talked about the guys who didn't want her playing in their club, but how was the rest of the community? Were you ostracized? Were you welcomed? Were you ghettoized? When Women's Comics and Pudge came out, um, we thought that we could sell in the women's bookshops. Women Liberation was, I was getting ready to say, was king in those days, but that's not quite correct. Um, uh, so there were tons of not only head shops, but um, women's bookstores. And uh, so we, we sent out letters and sent out a, few, a, a copy uh, or two of women's comics to about 25 women's bookstores. And with Pudge, um, we not only sent out a large number uh, of books to these bookstores, but personally called the bookstores. And the reaction was that um, uh, a complete misunderstanding and rejection of the work. Uh, for women's comics, it was because in some cases they showed women wanting to get it on with guys, uh, or they there was there were because of the variety of of stories, we had stories that would offend someone, <laughs> and and the same thing was true with Pudge, uh, the fact that she was that nobody read any of these stories; they just mm -hmm. flipped through, saw the pictures made assumptions and there you go. So with Pudge, um, it, just the fact that it was about a fat girl was enough for it to be rejected. And my favorite memory was a letter I got from Los Angeles uh, from a group of women who said that if they ever saw me in their town I wouldn't get out alive. Oh my God. Whoa. Women's Comics also uh, got um, hate mail. And if those of you who have seen the Women's Comics anthology, the collection actually, um, I reprinted the hate mail in there. Yeah. It was. That's important. No, that's oh, important. Oh no, I was absolutely delighted when we got hate mail, you know, and I <laughs> saved it, of course. And it was great, you know, it was like, I think it was from, it was really after our second issue, about 73 or so, um, it was they, little drawings of labyrinths and stuff, and they called themselves, gosh, I don't remember now, but something like Shining Star and Moon Glow, and they referred to us as, they, they, they started by calling us FBI. They thought we were the FBI and that we were, <laughs> we were just men masquerading as women, and uh, referred to us as, <laughs> they referred to us as crew cut she pricks. I've remembered oh, that nice one. God. It was a great letter, great letter. Uh, they said, <laughs> I think they said something about, we know where you live. And of course, they had to know where we lived because they sent us the letter. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there, there was a lot of really interesting discussions about what was okay and what was not okay. And I remember being in London um, on a panel like this, and we were, I was talking about how I really wanted to turn women on, that it was part of suspense, right? It's like mm. the cliffhanger, right? Same yeah. deal. So I thought, oh boy, you know, you're gonna get them right to the edge and then leave them. And this woman from the audience stood up and she said, 
you admit that you want to turn people on. <laughs> <laughs> the nerve of you. <laughs> that was enough for her. It was wrong. Yeah, I mostly got really, well, like, for instance, when I published Dynamite Damsels, I, well, actually, I got um, uh, the printer uh, who printed, I think, um, things that weren't underground comics was upset by it, and I guess there was a midnight call to the printing office, and they, they, they'll never print anything of mine again, but beyond that, once the book was out, I mostly got really, really positive um, feedback from like the underground comics, and of course from the women's bookstores, but it's really kind of feminist. I've got like that, mm. you know, red fist and the women's symbol right on the cover, and I use, you know, put the word lesbian on the cover, and it's, the content's very political. So that was, that was, um, that got me into the women's bookstores, I guess. I mean, it's too bad. They would have, would have loved to Pudge if they actually read it. Mm -hmm. But um, I also, um, I'd get some, actually I got some negative feedback from like other lesbians. I mean, there was one woman, there, I think I did a story where this woman, one of these characters had an open relationship and the page was ripped out and scribbled on and said, this is crap, this is awful, or whatever. So I think it might have just struck a nerve. And then I think there was like an all, a group of radical lesbians who didn't, didn't want me to sell them in bookstores that like men went into because they said, men aren't going to appreciate this. They're going to like draw penises on your dykes and they're going to mm -hmm. use it to ridicule women. And then I think there was, um, I forget, there was like a columnist in a zine at the time that sent me this angry letter saying, well, you know, you just want, you know, you just want to get men's money. You're, you know, putting men down in this magazine and, you know. But, you know, I mean, anything you do, it's going to strike somebody's nerve personally. But I've mostly, like I said, I can say I've mostly gotten very positive feedback from the stories I've done, which makes me happy. I'm curious. Oh, Howard, did you want to say something? Well, I mean, anybody who, you know, has known about my uh, career for a long time knows that my early underground comics were severely rejected by the uh, San Francisco group of uh, male Those are the same guys who rejected me, Howard, yeah. so yeah. we're yeah. in the same boat. So they didn't feel I was really underground because my stuff didn't look underground. It was uh, cute. It, it, looked sque it looked like something that could be in a daily newspaper and my idea at the time was yeah, it will have this surface but it has a subtext that's uh, uh, subversive. Uh, and this really upset me, but I was down in Alabama at the time, and so I didn't know anybody personally. And uh, so I got, you know, I had to go, you know, my therapist helped me work through this feeling of rejection. Uh, but the first time I was ever in the company of actual underground people was when I went to the 1976 Berkeley Con. And that's when I met uh, uh, Trina, who immediately gave me positive feedback uh, about my barefoot stories, and that meant a huge amount to me. And also, uh, um, never mind. Sorry, I've, I've got I've had name forgetting problems, so I've now can't uh, think of who I was going to talk about. Um, we uh, we distributed barefoots. Um, alternative feature service and this was an underground news uh, a feature service for underground newspapers and college newspapers and any overground newspapers that would uh, would hire our stuff and uh, Howard was a his work was a complete hit with the college newspapers because the uh, the sponsors or the mentors at the college newspapers would take a look at it and think, oh, that looks really sweet <laughs> and cute. And they wouldn't bother to read it. Um, that seems to be a theme. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, it was totally subversive. So they would okay it. And um, <laughs> so he had the most, he won the most newspapers to subscribe at the time. But that made him the most subversive as well. He was probably corrupting yes. more people than the underground yes. guys. Yep, yep, <laughs> absolutely. Fun. Po poisoning young minds. <laughs> <laughs> for 50 years. Fun. Well, also for me, 
back then I was friends with other cartoonists like Howard and Michael Goldberg and Jerry Mills and we all pretty much encouraged each other on with work and we would send each other copies of what we were working on and comment on them and you know a lot of times it felt like I was drawing comics more for my clique than for the general public and you know that kind of had a level of protection about it and uh, you know we were all kind of doing similar material and uh, you know a lot of us were also doing newspaper work you were doing Wendell for the Advocate and I was doing full pages for the Gay News and the Sentinel and a bunch of other newspapers and Jerry was doing his strip for In Touch magazine and Michael Goldberg did pretty much work all over the spectrum with that. So I'm curious, are you, are you still um, considered marginalized from the underground? If somebody's putting on a, a panel, like the history of underground comics, are any of you guys invited to be on it? I'm always included. Yeah, well, Trina, you're, you're sui generis. <laughs> sui generis. I think I, over time, I carved out a place <laughs> for myself, whether they like it or not. WonderCon has also done several panels on gay cartoonists over the years, and I was on one here about seven years ago in San Francisco that was really well attended. Well, I guess my question was not um, whether there are panels on gay cartoonists, but if there are panels on the underground where you get, you know, kind of the usual suspects, are gay cartoonists considered part of that group, or are, are, do you guys ever get a seat at that table? Sometimes, yes. That's good to know. Well, I think even though we still have a fair bit of time, we have a few, quite a few people in the audience there, and I bet that they have questions for you guys. Yes, sir. Um, so I'll just say, uh, I've been a big fan of all of you for years, and I started reading uh, gay comics from a comic relief bookstore in, uh, comic book store in Berkeley. And so it is just amazing to see you all in one place, and you really did change my life. I do happen to know that there are lots of graphic novels by lesbians out there. Uh, just, just go to your comic book store and ask for them. I'd say that this, this weekend will probably give you quite a bit of grist for the mill. I think if you just go to the, the bookshop right here, you'll, you'll find a lot of options. I, I recognize several people in the audience who have books there that I would recommend. And uh, as you go to the panels, you're going to be discovering people's art over the next two days if, you can, if, you can, if you're sticking it out for the whole time. Oh, yeah, that's why I'm here. Good. They'll Good. be happy to take your money. <laughs> My suggestion is pay attention to the more recent anthologies like uh, Queer and um, No Straight Lines. No Straight lines and, uh, Edited the, by our own Justin Hall. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, what's the other one that was... Alphabet, alphabet. Uh, you know, they're a showcase. I mean, some of us old timers got in there, but a showcase for, you know, the new crop of cartoonists and the sort of middle crop of cartoonists and a lot of people because the, the, the universe of talented LGBT, um, you know, cartoonists has, has grown so much. And so it's kind of dazzling all the talent out there. If you want to read up and comers, so to speak, um, pay attention to Kickstarter. It's dicey, mm. but there's some wonderful work coming up there that, and the other crowdfunding sites, because that's become the apprenticeship model. It used to be you studied under somebody, then you self-published. Now you go right to Kickstarter with your book, and that's a mixed bag because you don't have an editor, but there's some amazing and innovative work that's just coming out because people are just putting it out there. I just want to touch briefly on the it wasn't there before because we live in a liberated zone and there's a lot of countries where it still isn't there. Thank True. You. And just to point out that um, Mar Martina Shreit, who's sitting here, her, her comic <coughs> books are going to Ukraine and Chechnya. And for those people, they haven't had that yet. So it's still being done. Also, if you go to little independent cons, 
you know, not the big comic cons, but I, I don't, are, are you here on the West Coast? Yeah, I don't know the West Coast, I'm afraid. I could only list the ones on the East Coast, but uh, I don't know if they have things like FlameCon out here or... Um, there's a Queer Comics Expo in There we July. go. There's a Queer Comics Expo in July, says July, Burton. Two-day expo. There you go. So... And where, and, and, uh, it's here in San Francisco. Um, I actually just got a, a, a notice from a friend of mine on Facebook. Um, I didn't know it was coming up, but uh, I went to it last year. It's a lot of independent comics and people self-publishing, and uh, it's being held, I think, about mid-July, but it's called Queer Comics Expo. Excellent. I think in, I think actually this weekend, which is bad timing, there's one at Western Washington University in Bellingham, a Queer Comics Expo. Um, they're just all over the place, so just start Googling and... You know, queers, comics, um, expo, and so forth. Yeah, I don't think you can count on your comic book shop coming through for you. It depends on the comic shop. Some of them will still do a good job, but they're constrained by what their distributor carries. So. True, true. They're dependent on Diamond. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, hello. Yeah, you. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to just ask uh, the panel what they think about uh, the difference between uh, what is uh, considered like a, a underground, like queer story, you know, and like what is it, the difference between that and like what you know we, you would see now in like a you know like a gay film, you know, or like something that's considered like you know more mainstream but still like not straight, you know. I'm just wondering if, you, if, you, if there's a difference between like the kind of stories that you you've done that you, you continue doing that are underground. In that underground feeling, uh, 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 I'm just wondering if you, if you think that there's a difference between like mainstream queer stories and the underground stuff that you do. Did everybody hear that question? So the question is, uh, what does the panel think is the difference between underground queer stories and mainstream queer stories? This is a this is the question of our time now because I remember Allison saying. I don't know what to do. I'm not part of the alternative anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I mean, and I have to say, looking back at some of the R. Crumb stuff, it's like, God, it looks so tame now. Mm -hmm. There's something, something about, about what's happening that is, is really asking a lot of questions, I think, of us as artists. Well, the mainstream gay presentation is still sanitized for the most part. I think uh, underground stories or personal stories have specifics that uh, convey a lot. Uh, and you rarely find that in mainstream work. The, the mainstream superheroes, for instance. Uh, the, the kind of depth of storytelling that I think you'll find in alternative or indie work you won't find there. I have to take exception. One of the things that, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things that was refreshing um, in the issue that I did initially with Howard, um, Cy Ross and the SQ syndrome, is that Howard said that you could utilize nudity uh, in the story if it indeed um, furthered the story. And I actually drew sex in, in that first issue. I didn't show it in any of the slides here, but I felt the freedom to be able to do that because it really fit with what I was trying to convey. I want to just add to what Lee was saying about the mainstream superhero books. I mean, it's nice that they are finally realizing that there is diversity in comics, but for the most part, it's like they're really just still superheroes. I mean, so, you know, is it Batgirl who's gay? I can't remember. That woman is a lesbian, but she's still a hot babe in a skin tight outfit. Kate Kane, like Katie Keene, huh? So, <laughs> but you know, they're really, they're still superheroes, and they're still formula, and they still have to fight, you know, for the, from the, the villain who wants to destroy the universe. And then, oh, they happen to be, you know, LGBTQ. I don't want to get too far off topic, and I hate disagreeing with you because you're so sweet. <laughs> fluffy, she's fluffy. <laughs> I don't know, I've never fluffed her. Um, it, was <laughs> it was right there. All I did was pick it up. Um, but 
there are the thing about superhero comics right now, and I've always been an apologist for superhero stuff, is for every rule that used to apply to superheroes, there are now three exceptions. Talk about body image, look at Faith. Beautiful. Faith is Zephyr. She's a, a he Zoftig, a heavy set female superhero who is confident and uses her powers effectively and lives in the real world and her body size is not an issue for anybody, including her. It's brilliant. So that goes back to Eddie Candy, though. That's nothing yeah. new. So it is, because Eddie Candy was an apologist for that stuff. Eddie Candy has never been, at least in the 40s, Eddie Candy was a model for the stereotype fat chick. This is, this is a fat woman who's not afraid of being fat, not ashamed of being fat, and it's wonderful. Eddie Candy wasn't either. I take issue on that. <laughs> We're now talking about Wonder Woman. We'll be back in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you say that such characters are still the tokenism at this point? There's yes. one Zopti superhero and yeah. one. So far. Okay. And she's some? not by the big two either. She's yeah. she's on Valiant. Um, yeah, um, but they're they're like in the top five. And it's a start. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. You got to start someplace, baby. I've always, you know, I basically am not a superhero person. Uh, I enjoyed Batman and Superman when I was a kid and some others, uh, but once I became interested in comics as a s serious medium for things about the real world, I lost interest in, in the whole superhero model. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's good to mention that the actual term underground uh, has become pretty obsolete because it was very specifically linked to the 60s counterculture. Um, once you, once that, you know, once the uh, hippies uh, sort of moved into the mainstream or into the, uh, you know, did farms or whatever, um, the, uh, you know, the, the idea of doing creator-owned stuff that had real soul from the heart of the artist uh, continued, you know, in the form of. Um, you know, indie comics, alternative comics, ground level comics, things like that. And it, did, it didn't matter as much that they be outrageous in terms of breaking taboos, but they could break taboos if they felt like it. Yeah. And uh, the world got used to, with the exception of, you know, some, you know, horrible prosecutors here and there, uh, the world began to get used to the fact that it wouldn't kill, you know, a, a kid if they accidentally saw a drawing of somebody naked. Uh, but I, I, think, I don't think there are underground comics now. There's mainstream, which really has to do with distribution. Where are things available? Uh, are they available in uh, e bookstores, you know, Barnes & Noble? Or are they something you have to seek out uh, at indie cons and things like that? Um, but I think that even in the mainstream, whether it's in the mainstream or in indie comics, Everything depends on the quality of the work, the intention of the creator, and how much a level of honesty is in the books. And that's, that's very important. That's why most of them are, have a single creator rather than a uh, you know, team. Don't you think that the underground, though, is also tied to um, the code? Uh, yes. um, and the code, the, you know, the code, how many people know when the code ended? Well, one thing which... No, when the code ended, oh. not when it was first violated, when the comics code dissolved. 2011, yeah, 2011. Archie and DC were the last two people who were members, and Archie pulled out first. <laughs> so to speak. So to speak, exactly. And then DC went... All right, whatever. <laughs> well, beyond the comics code, there was also a disastrous Supreme Court ruling in the mid-'70s that basically yes. set the law that communities could set their own standards for what is considered obscenity. Absolutely. And uh, that kind of ended it for the head shops at that point, and especially their comic shops that really cast a shadow over it, a business that sold material to children, and there were books with sex in them. You know, I mean, finding places to actually carry it, that really put a damper on the underground comic scene back then. What year was that, Howard? You did an article on that, 73, yeah. 
And it took us a long time to get beyond that, and that was still in effect when he started Gay Comics, too. Yep, by then, uh, the first issue of Gay Comics came out in 1980. Uh, Dennis Kitchen's uh, company, Kitchen Sink Press, or, or Kitchen Sink Comics, had practically been, you know, killed by that Supreme Court ruling. Uh, there were always artists who wanted to draw underground comics, and there were always people who wanted to read underground comics, but the distribution system dropped out because of stores that were afraid they would be prosecuted if they sold underground comics. So it was, a, but then in the late 70s, Dennis, you know, slowly came back with, with kitchen sink comics that, uh, and by the time 1980 arrived, we still felt free to, uh, you know, show all the sexual stuff uh, the warning. But Dennis realized uh, and said to me explicitly that he felt the day of underground comics being all about breaking taboos uh, was gone. There just weren't that many taboos that had not already been broken to death. And he wanted to do comics that had social relevance. And uh, doing gay comics was part of that. Peripheral to that, um, one of the things that happened in the early to mid 1970s was that a lot of the businesses that carried undergrounds were head shops. Mm. And head shops started going under until a few of them realized they could stay in business by just switching and that they became the first comic stores. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, no, I can't even see who that is. Yes, okay. thank you. This is one of the things that I'm proudest of. Strip that AIDS. Along, yes, Strip AIDS USA, along with Robert Tripto, God bless you, Robert, um, and um, Bill Sienkiewicz in New York, the three of us edited a, um, an, an anthology book. The theme was gay, uh, well, the theme was AIDS, and uh, we made a lot of money for Thank you <laughs> for, for AIDS-related causes. It was published by Ron Turner. And Ron, uh, somebody here was talking about someone who said yes before you could even talk, finish talking. When I phoned Ron and told him we wanted to do this benefit book, before I could even finish my sentence, he said yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very proud of this. Um, and it was gay and straight cartoonists. I mean, we all, and women, everything. You know, everyone in this book. I was their political cartoonist for the San Francisco Sentinel from 81 to 84. And when AIDS first started, I began doing cartoon strips about it. And pretty much for the next couple of decades, ended up drawing several hundred strips. And being a political cartoonist, it was just kind of natural to take that role. and. It's just amazing we're still at this point where it still is a problem. I was, uh, when I was doing the Wendell strip uh, during most of the 80s, and it took me a while to figure out how to introduce AIDS. I knew ultimately it had to be in the strip um, because the idea of Wendell was that Wendell lived in the same world as the readers of The Advocate, the gay magazine it was published in. and. Uh, it was impossible to ignore, but it was also quite scary to do comics about because you knew that readers of the comic uh, were among those who were, you know, their lovers had died or they were at death's door. Uh, it was extremely real to them, and I was not HIV positive, and I didn't want to trivialize. And so this is, uh, this is something I had to think about how to explore. Eventually, I did do it. Uh, and, uh, but, I, but that was, that's, just, that's something for the next panel I'm on. <laughs> I just want to make the point, um, my primary source of income right now is taking care of people with AIDS. So yeah, we made a lot of progress, but we're not out of the woods yet. So still play careful, folks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take more questions from the audience, but I, I have one, uh, one more here myself. I was just wondering, we've, we, there have been so many amazing strides in the last decade, right? We've gone from uh, 
bans in the military and bans on gay marriage to, to acceptance. But now we're in a, a new, darker era, one would seem. Do you guys see uh, a, a need for a new underground coming? I, I think a, one of the big problems we're all facing is where are we? The big cities that where we were kind of born and hatched are very expensive. Those of us who mm -hmm. happen to have a building somewhere, we've all said goodbye to our friends. So I think in a way, the, the, the whole community is just sort of uh, dispersed. There's a kind of dispersal that wasn't there earlier. But that's good. You're good. That, that, that's very good. Maybe that's more of a reason to, that we need comic books more. Well, now, now, we're, now we're everywhere. The means of production are decentralized. Yep. And that means that anybody and her sister could put out work and does. We've got some incredible work coming out in Minneapolis right now. And all you guys do is fly over it. We're doing great <laughs> stuff there. <laughs> but I think what we're talking about is, is uh, that man in Washington, yes. who I will not call president, um, and his cohorts, who are like cartoon characters yes. themselves, um, and you know, yeah, I live in a bubble, and I'm glad I live in a bubble. <laughs> and, you know, I can wear my, my, I'm not taking this off until he's impeached. Um, I can wear my, my Hillary button, and people smile and say, yeah, I like your button, you know. Um, but there are places, you were talking about flying over, um, there are places where I'm not sure I could get away with my Hillary button. Mm. And um, I think that we all fight, we all join the resistance and do what we can. It may be time for a resistance comic. Yes. There is one. There is, there is resist. one. Um, it's Francois, oh, it's called Resist. Francoise yeah. Mouly and her daughter, Nadja Spiegelman, um, ah. have been editing it. Uh, and Gabe Fowler of Desert Island Comics in Brooklyn has been publishing it. Yeah. And they're about to start their second issue. Yeah, deadline for submissions to issue two is, I think, the 20th. There you go. And what's ironic about this moment in his history is that we're in the majority. I mean, you know, most people didn't want Trump. That's right. right. So that's a very different feeling than being a, a tiny <laughs> secret. Uh, it's a very unusual feeling that you have, yeah. There's a very, there's a book coming out as a benefit for Planned Parenthood. I don't know the title of the book, but I contributed to it. I wrote a five page story for it. God, is this the second book? How many books do we have to do? <laughs> <laughs> Also, just the whole concept of the underground. I mean, everything we do is like on the internet. I mean, we're like, mm. you know, the last story I did, it's like all over Facebook and got shared 60 times. So it's not exactly like you're going to the head shop and buying an underground comic. I mean, it's every, you know, it's, you know, all the, great everybody's seeing it. The problem is when people need to uh, express themselves and take a stand and resist, uh, but who also deserve to be paid for their work. Mm. Yeah. And the greatest uh, majority of outlets for cartooning of any sort, gay, straight, anything, is online, and most of it uh, is done for free. Or through um, a, a patronage model like Patreon, which is essentially the traveling minstrel going around with his comics door to door saying, here, I drew this, give me food. Yeah, but it's allowing a lot of people to continue doing their work. I mean, I. It, it, you don't have to contribute more than a, a buck or two a month, but you get enough people doing that, then you've got somebody who can pay their rent and, and not have to worry about well, I'm in expenses. Favor of it's a, their it's rent. a great thing, Patreon. Other questions from the audience? Um, I, I, I oh, would sorry, like to Vaughn. say one thing about underground comics now is that I see a lot of parallels with underground comics with the adult animation that's happening now. There's a lot of edgy shows out there in the Cartoon Network that deals with a lot of the same themes kind of in a newer context that we would also deal with in comics, you know, drawing back in the day. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, given that all of you amazing people have done so much incredible trailblazing for uh, queer artists over the last decade, what would you like to see as, I suppose, the mission going forward for the queer artists of today? What work should we be doing to further our cause? Did everybody well, hear that? you know that. <laughs> Did everybody hear that question? Yes. Yeah? OK. Do something that'll piss us off. <laughs> Sir?
I would say what's really needed is to stay engaged in the world, uh, which may mean things that have nothing to do with LGBT issues just have to do with human, human concerns and democratic concerns. Uh, there's much to do comics about in many ways. I think that uh, we need to not be totally turned inward uh, and just be talking about our own you know, travails, but uh, address the larger world seriously and passionately. Yes, okay. Um, in the 90s, I think, uh, there was a collection called Black Strippers. And I, I forgot, didn't we have the publisher was? I know. I can't remember. It's British, wasn't it? It was British. Yeah. It was a British book. Was it? Yes, it was I published it was by, um, published by, I think they called themselves Fanny. Yes. It was Carol, uh, Carol Bennett. Knockabout. Knockabout, yes, yes. Were they the ones that did that women's anthology Wait. before the free collection? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. I thought so. Um, but it just seems like uh, I thought for 15 years that there needs to be a second, a, a further edition. Does anyone know about anything like that in the works? Apparently the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> you could put one together. Yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happens, really. You say, no one has done this, somebody needs to do it, and you do it. That's how I did Sandy Comes Out. That's how I put together It Ain't Me, Babe. That's how Robert and I and Bill Sienkiewicz did Strip Aids USA. You say, no one's doing it, it needs to be done, and you do that's it. How I, that's why I'm doing old. No yeah. one's doing it. Yeah. yeah. We're all doing old. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, in the the tragedy of being old is not that one is old, but that one is young. <laughs> That's Oscar Wilde. <laughs> nice. Uh, we live in the age of the archival edition, and in fact, half of the world is in which is like this amazing, amazing thing. And I know Stroke, No Straight Lines did a little bit of this curatorial aspect of linking the underground to the more modern cartoonists, but I look at that really handsome, complete women's comics book that Metagraphics last year that's really gorgeous mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if there's any kind of will to doing like a complete gay comics even if it was like for a limited library edition or something it just seems like what what the challenges would be to get something like that going in a more complete edition it's it's a compl complicated thing because all of the work for gay comics is owned by the uh, creators uh, they own the copyright and they are not only scattered all over the place, but many of them are dead. And you're talking about getting the rights from their heirs who may or may not be gay friendly. So it's a, a major job, which could be done if someone has a lot of energy and spare time, but to track down, to do a complete uh, gay comics, you know, would be very difficult. I think, you know, uh, Robert would probably agree with me, right, uh, Robert? Uh, Wow. Everyone that we asked was delighted. I mean, they were going they to get alive. paid again. There were a lot. Um, and they were alive. But there were people we couldn't find. But when there's people you, couldn't, you can't find, you'll find it in the women's collection. There's a little thing that says, you know, we we got permission from everyone we could find and and if you're still there and we're sorry we couldn't find you but contact us and and we'll pay you you know something as simple as that yeah if you do your due diligence correct me if I'm wrong but I thought since it's a facsimile you can you know you can include items that you know you didn't get permission that's the difference between I think they're that's what I thought that's what I heard I'm not sure if that's correct but that's why it's a facsimile to do complete works uh, it does not fall under the fair use exception to copyright law. No. If you wanted to do a panel or two uh, from someone's comic without getting permission, that's a different matter. That, that falls under the fair use 
exception. Not if, not if it's for a commercial publication. Well, Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess part of this would mean, mean, depend on what is a commercial publication. I mean, if a scholarly, if a, if a scholarly book is happening and it's going to be you know, sold to schools, I mean, money will be exchanged. Scholars have to get permissions. Yeah. And sometimes they have to pay money yeah. for permissions, and sometimes they don't use images because they can't afford the permissions cost. Well, I understand it's, it's worthy of a, a panel on its own that doesn't have to do anything with queer because <laughs> I did a lot of research about copyright law um, when I was doing a series of articles about the Air Pirates case, which was a mm. notorious case uh, where Disney sued uh, underground artists who used Disney characters. And uh, one of the memorable things that uh, one of the important uh, copyright lawyers uh, said uh, in one of his articles was that he counseled people against asking permission yeah. because he felt it was degrading. It was giving people the idea that they could veto things that that really, you know, if it is for public discussion, if it is to illustrate, you know, a public discussion and it does not use more than a small portion, it does not in any way use something that could compete uh, with the, you know, sale of the original, that uh, he said you sh not only did not need permission, but you should not get permission because it gives publishers the wrong idea. I've learned that because I've done a number of books that are histories of women cartoonists, and uh, there were a couple of cases where I had an editor who insisted I get permission, and uh, all that happened was, for instance, to reprint even a panel by Ramona Fraden, DC asked me for $200. So I said, fuck that, and I printed it anyway. <laughs> and you know, no one has sued me. And, and you know, now the rule is, if you want to reprint it, just do it, don't ask it. Well, if the artist is alive, make sure it's okay with the artist. But if it's just some mainstream company or syndicate that owns the work and the artist won't get paid anyway, forget it, just print it. Says the person who owns her own house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I, was do, when I was doing uh, uh, both uh, my Wendell collection and uh, Stuck Over Baby, uh, in both cases I used often song lyrics uh, in the background to set the time and tone and everything. I was told uh, by St. Martin's Press, which published the first Wendell collections, that I had to change places where I had quoted Beatles songs, because they <laughs> said the uh, Apple was extremely litigious, uh, famously so, as is Disney, mm. and uh, said that, true, you might have the right to use them, but uh, they will sue you even if they know that they can't win, and they will bankrupt you uh, just by making you pay lawyers fees. And so they so I had to change all, you know, find other songwriters. But basically they said the rule was 10 words or less of a song lyric is fair use. Ancillary to that, it was announced at a panel this morning that Stuck River Baby is going back into print at a larger size. Is this a true thing? Yeah. Sad to say, that's somebody's wish. Yeah, I we just are, said that you got your rights back. It was Justin who said, I hope that means it's uh, being reprinted yeah, at a larger thank you. size. Thank you. Cause, cause <laughs> I heard but I will say, I have been authorized to say uh, that there a, a, an option contract for a television series based on Stuck of a Baby was signed in the last month. That's better than my idea. I just thought of an IDW artist edition. We're trying to get it back into print, and I would love it if it would be the larger page size that we used in some of the foreign editions. It's, it's the size that I originally intended for the book to be, but DC uh, had some practical reasons that they wanted it to be a smaller page size. Do we have Small one more? Oops, mind sorry. <laughs> Do we have one more question? Time for one more question. Um, I, I, was, I was really curious about your literary influences. Because uh, I know you love, love comics, but like, I'm sure you also read just 
Books. <laughs> Pros. Pros. Samuel Delaney, Alfred Bester, Joanna Russ, the classics. I, too, am a science fiction fan, so uh, Joanna Russ, Vonda McIntyre, etc. I tended to be uh, affected by playwrights a lot, and I can't off the top of my head recite their names, but uh, theater uh, was a big part of my life when I was in college age, and I think that you can see the influence of theater in the comics that I do. In my early 20s, I really got into Russian literature, and that really Whoa. affected my writing style a lot, a lot especially <laughs> Dostoevsky. Oh my god. <laughs> I, I've been reading science fiction since I was 14, and it's a big influence. Not just the women, but all of them. You know, Bradbury, Sturgeon, everyone. Yeah, I like essayists, and I've always read a lot of nonfiction, so right now I think my two favorite writers are Aria Levy and Masha Gessen. But she's a comic. We're talking about books. <laughs> and actually, Robert, in our in our last moments, would you like to come up and contribute in any way to this? No. Are you sure? Yay. <laughs> Robert only agreed to come to this conference if we didn't make him be on a panel. Ah, okay. Never mind then. Time for one last question. Yes, I see your hand. <laughs> I think the amount of uh, people of color who appeared in the underground comics has great significance, particularly in the South American comics. There are tons of mainstream South American comics that came out after our work uh, that featured black people, Asian people, etc. For me, it always was a real challenge because on one side you have to have inclusion, but on the other side you can't rip off another person's experience. I mean, for me, I would just try to encourage people of different backgrounds to do their own work. Yeah, I, I consciously wanted the Wendell world not to be an all-white world, and I had you know some African American characters in there, but I did not feel knowledgeable enough. I mean, most of my friends of color were, you know, similar to me, were middle class people, their backgrounds were similar. Um, so it was when I did Stuck with a Baby and was drawing people who had experiences far, far, far from mine uh, that I had to do serious digging, uh, uh, you know, to, to get to know them and hear their stories and make sure that everything wasn't just from a white boy's perspective. One of my first characters was a black woman. Uh, it, there she is. Uh, I called her Fox, and I did a lot of, uh, in the early 70s, a lot of political comics starring her. So uh, I've been doing that a lot in the old days. I don't draw comics anymore. Well, um, oh. as I said earlier, um, my uh, comic output has been rather limited, but the first strip I did was uh, featured African Americans, and the last one that I did, which is called Someday My Prince Will Come, features an African American and an Asian. When I was doing my uh, strip for Lavender Magazine, Tranny Towers, after I got one of my um, trans sisters out of um, her abusive relationship, I decided her next girlfriend would be of Asian descent. And it wasn't any political thing, it was just who she met. And it worked out really well because she had an older sister who was very dykey and very trans resistant. So it served as kind of a dichotomy of how one marginalized culture interacts with another one. Who wants to have the last word? Draw comics.
Thank you so much to this incredibly distinguished panel. Thank you all for coming and go eat lunch. <laughs>